Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. You have to keep gambling and you have to gamble on marketing. Like the ga- marketing is like one of those things where you have to put the dollars in. Like I see in the group all the time. Sometimes I'm like, am I in a tourpreneur group or am I in like SEOs anonymous or something like that? And that's because they feel like, oh, if I just get that number one ranking, well, that's fantastic. You're like well, rank number one organically. Well, did you build your own website? Fantastic. It's probably pretty crappy. Is there ad copy in there? Probably not because you're not thinking about, you don't have a sales mindset. You're, you're not like thinking from a customer's point of view as, as to how to close them. You're just thinking about like, man, they're going to really enjoy this bit of cheese or wine or waterfall or whatever it is. And you're not thinking from a, um, you're not thinking from a point of you have to continue to you have to continue to invest over and over and over again. And marketing is a continual investment. Hello, tourpreneurs. Welcome back to another episode of Tourpreneur Podcast. Today, I am super stoked to have Kevin O'Neill from Destiny Water Ventures down in Florida. Uh, runs a water sports company down in Florida, as well as being another podcast host. So we've got something in common there. Kevin runs with uh, Greg Fisher, the Awkward Water Guys podcast. If that wasn't busy enough, he also hosts an event each year down in Orlando, where he gets lots of water sports guys from all over the southern USA to come in. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend that event this year. Uh, and it's a bloody good event. Anybody gets the chance to go to that event, I strongly recommend you do. Uh, unfortunately, Kevin also ordered the hurricane at the same time I was there, so I had a bit of an issue getting out of Florida, but we, we won't hold that against them. <laughs> so over the last five years, Kevin has been through some challenges and opportunities, the same as the rest of us. He lost his best re- location, I believe. He had to yeah. deal with COVID, but no surprise there. The rest of us had to deal with that. But he also managed to fit in a heart attack. However, <laughs> during that time, he managed to go from one boat to 25 boats. And as I said, as well as that, he also runs a podcast and he also runs that event. So quite a lot going on. So from yeah. my experience with Kevin, meeting him at the various events, various charts during COVID, met up a few times face to face. I'm quite happy to say Kevin has some of the strongest opinions in the tour operator world <laughs> around business management. Probably even stronger than mine. And I thought I had the strongest opinions. <laughs> There's probably another warning on this podcast is pre-meeting Kevin, I thought I swore the most in the tour operator world. I was wrong. I'm often wrong. I was wrong on that one. Kevin swears more than me. So if you're easily offended, this is not the podcast for you because we both cursed quite a lot. <laughs> so, Kevin, welcome. How did the heart mm-hmm. attack go for you? How did that work out? That was great, man. I got a, I got, a, I got a free helicopter tour out of it from one hospital yeah. to the other. So the value, the value just follows me around. <laughs> it's all about new experiences, eh? Yeah, yeah. It was really exciting, uh, man. Yeah. I don't know if I can live up to that intro, man. Like I, I don't feel like you know, <laughs> I don't feel like I've done anything that great, man. That's quite the intro. I think we should just check out right there because I. I feel like I can only be underwhelming from here. <laughs> I, I know you've got lots of knowledge in your head that hopefully I can drag some of it uh, uh, to, to help the operators there. Uh, not recommending they all go and have a heart attack like you did, like, but there you go. It's an yeah. experience. You probably don't yeah. want to repeat that one, so maybe you've calmed down a bit now, eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, for for certain, man. I, I've I've chilled out a lot. <laughs> chilled out a lot. Uh, you know, the, the the helicopter tour I think was like really interesting because I got the bill for it and then minus my insurance, and it was something like forty thousand dollars. Like we don't have the, the healthcare like you guys do across the pond there. So yeah, yeah it was like a forty thousand dollar ten minute helicopter ride. 
And as I said, I felt like, you know, maybe the heart, I've never been in a, a helicopter. So it was, uh, it was, and I've never had a stent put in and, and I've never had a heart attack. So it was, was quite an experience, man. It was a whole day of <laughs> fun new experiences. <laughs> <laughs> Met all sorts of new people, cardiologists and all sorts of doctors. It was, it was really neat, man. <laughs> next next time I see you in person, maybe we should go for a helicopter ride without the heart attack. Man. We'll go see like the Grand Canyon or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not the inside of a ER room. So Kevin, if you could just give the listeners a bit of background on when you started your business and how you got going, why you got going, how you got going, where you are now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I started back in 2017. I was a parasail captain in Key West. Um, and I don't know what we necessarily call them parasail tours, but it was an hour long uh, experience, you know, we chatted up the guests and had fun. So I, I felt like a tour guide a, a little bit. So talked a lot about the area. So not even though like water sports is really, we can get this sort of branding on it. And th there's not too much difference between what we do. And maybe it's not as, as educational, but it's definitely entertaining and, and fun. And I, I enjoyed that. And I did that for about 10 years. And, and I got the call, the entrepreneurial call and the, the bug in my brain. Uh, as I, as I kept on year after year plugging away, I really enjoyed it, but I started thinking to myself, like I can do this myself. And, yep. and, um, as like a lot of entrepreneurs do like one of those things I was scared. I didn't want to take the leap. I had, I had a family. I just had my second daughter and the idea of leaving where I had been the last 10 years and going out into a, a new place and starting an entire new life starting a business, which I had never done, seemed extremely daunting to me, but it also was very exciting. I had hit a, a ceiling where I was at, at my, in my position in Key West, and I, man, I needed to keep moving. I needed to be upwardly mobile. So I, I answered that call, and that was back in, in 2017, and I haven't really looked back since. How did you start and where did you start? What was your activities you started with? Yeah, so I, I I came from Key West uh, t for a, a vacation in in North Florida, and I had heard about some uh, parasailers I knew that were flying up here, and they had it was seasonal, where Key West was year round. I was pretty good about saving money, so initially I thought to myself that I could come up here and and maybe just fly, get Christmases off because. I, I do have that entrepreneurial story of working seven days a work, week, getting up Christmas morning at 6 a.m., waking my kids up and then being on the boat to parasail on Christmas Day because that's when the money was there. So I was just kind of over that life and I was kind of looking forward to maybe taking a couple months off. And so I came up here for a vacation to kind of scout out. The, well, I told my wife it was for a vacation, but I was I was scouting the area and sort of looking at the way things were set up up here, you know? And um, so we got here and I, when I started looking at all of the companies, the, f the first thing I noted was noticed was how outdated their marketing was. So initially I came here looking for a job, house, normalcy, not seven days a week <laughs> and just and, and like taking it easy and getting a couple months off. And then that's where the, the seed kind of got planted. We're up here in Destin. If you're not unfamiliar, uh, Pensacola is the, the larger metropolis. Uh, our company is in Fort Walton Beach, which is right next to Destin, kind of like a secondary market. But we came up here, and 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 I, I got the idea, and I, it just it, it didn't leave me. And uh, yeah, that was that was five years ago. And before that, as I said, I was in Key West in South Florida, um, driving the parasail boat. And oh, the tour. The tour we got started doing that was so when I came here, it was like parasailing, boat rentals, jet ski rentals. Uh, not the boats and jet ski side of it, I had no experience in uh, uh, renting or doing anything like that. As I said, I was a licensed captain, drove the parasail boat, and oddly enough, we I want what I wanted to do and what I started to do for the first two years was a an all inclusive uh, water sport. Uh, sort of do everything as you want. We we had a couple jet skis, some kayaks, some paddle boards. We would load the boat up. We'd go out to the island, 
a small island out in the Santa Rosa Sound. If you're unfamiliar with a, a sound is, is like a sound is when, when we have hurricanes come in and then uh, they had areas in where Ian hit uh, where they had actually, they, these are like barrier sounds. So it's like you have the Gulf of Mexico, you have a few small barrier islands, and then you have uh, the actual sound, which is like a protected bay. So it's closer to, to a lake. Um, so Ian hit that sort of area that, that sound like area that they have in, in Fort Myers. I'm not a hundred percent sure on the geology. They might not call it a sound up there, but regardless, we have these barrier islands that uh, were actually man-made. So they dredged up these, they dredged up these, the sand to make the intracoastal waterway. So um, shipping uh, container vessels can get through and, and do interstate commerce and uh, international or national commerce through for all the way for Texas. So they dredged this up, they put the, you know, man-made sand islands there. And uh, I thought it was a, be a great place to do a trip, bring people out there. Uh, they have a licensed captain. We could watch them. Um, if you, if you ever, if you're ever familiar with my show, I'm, I'm a crazy man when it comes to safety. So I, I always like to monitor people. So we went out to the islands and we did that trip and we did that for about two years. Um, in our area, there's a place called Crab Island. And when I got here, I was I, I didn't realize how politicized this area was because again, it's 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 like right in between the Sound and the Gulf of Mexico. It's maybe sort of like a no man's land if you're unfamiliar with the territory. But this is like a, like a Lake Havasu or uh, Lake of the Ozarks where boats come out. And people draft up and they party, highly congested, highly trafficked, very popular, uh, very popular tourist destination. So I wanted to stay away from that, sort of do my own thing out at these islands. And we would we would go out there and bring our jet skis and kayaks, paddle boards, set up chairs, provide lunch. And, you know, from going like, man, I'm not going to work seven days a week. Well, I was working seven days a week. I was going to say, how did that work out on your plan yeah. not to work seven days a week? <laughs> well, I was, I was starting at about at 5 a.m. at our local Walmart and getting all the food for lunch and getting home at about uh, 9 p.m. at night by the time it was all said and done. And um, in, in our industry, you 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 have uninspected and inspected vessels. Just to sort of like give you a little bit of context what I was doing, uh, an uninspected vessel, which is what I had, I didn't have a big catamaran, one of these big party boats. I had a small pontoon boat that I could legally take six people on. And so what I was doing was, is as the trip got popular, I was going and getting six, going back to the island, getting six, going back to the island, going back and forth. And um, I didn't realize that I had set up shop at a very, like a locals only island. And uh, the county got wind of it. Uh, I was accosted by the, the county commissioners and ABC News. Uh, while I was out there, it was like 7.30 in the morning. And, and uh, I don't know if you guys do video now, but I'm like, I'm a pretty tatted up guy. I got a lot of tattoos. Uh, I'm a sailor. I'm out there in the water in like setting up my, my trip. And when they roll up, I'm thinking they're like Coast Guard or, or Sheriff or something like this because they're dressed in like flak jackets and all this shit. And I didn't realize they're a county commissioner. And so I just <laughs> go grab my all my documentation. And I'm like, again, shirtless, board shorts, set shit up. I'm like, I feel like I'm being bothered at this point by the Coast Guard or Sheriff. So I'm like, here's my paperwork get away from me i'm going to finish setting my stuff up and the moment i started talking unfortunately <laughs> my big mouth they lifted these cameras so i'm on a fucking rant <laughs> you know like telling them what i'm doing and whatever and and, and then I, and like halfway through it i'll go what are the cameras for and, and they're like oh you're on abc news da, 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 da. And i'm so confused and then two nights later they air it and it's like this they're tr they're tr they thought i was like running an illegal charter and right. I had my I had my license. I I even had the so they have a, a crab island permit. So because I've been in this industry a long time, I I knew that they wanted their whatever it was, 200 bucks of their permit. So I was paying to play. I, I knew the game. So when they rolled up, I had everything they had. And the and honestly, the 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 commissioner that had come out there says a gotcha sort of looked like a jackass because I had everything I needed to be doing. I had all my business license. I had my drug consortium. I had I have every, and this is what I said. I go, I go, I have every permit known to man here, like right here. They didn't even look at it. So there was a little bit of egg on their face and they, they called a, um, they called a meeting and 
I showed up, I showed up to the meeting in my button up shirt and nice dress pants. And you know, now I, I realize what kind of clown show these sort of, sort of things are. I would just come in my fucking pajamas. And, <laughs> what I, mean? like, I don't care, you know. But then I was like, you know, I'm gonna present my case. They're gonna understand that what I'm doing is a good thing for the tourist community. And this area is very like if any of you guys are familiar or tried to do business, as I'm sure you all have, like you know that these these county commissioners, especially in small beach towns, it's like they call it a bubba system, an old boy system. And and the cards are very much like they the people are from here. That to give you an idea, one of the guys that get up to to speak against me gets up and, and as I said earlier, I'm from uh, our big tourist town is called Destin, Florida. This guy gets up and he goes, "Hi guys, I'm Parker Destin." And I'm like, it's like Fred Florida not available. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Your last name is Destin? I had no idea what kind of uh, hornet's nest I had, I had kind of stung. But all of these people are there. There's all these people that live along the Sound that have these multi-million dollar homes that the last thing they want is like a Crab Island Part 2 or a water sports party happening on these on this island back behind their house. And here I am. I look like, you know, a uh, uh, felon of the of the year award with my neck <laughs> tattoos and had tattoos around all these like distinguished members of the community and i had this whole thing written out and by the time i was sitting in the front seat because i'm hard of hearing and and I'm, I'm so i'm sitting in the front seat and there's this person after person after person who knows me who knows my name who watched the special on abc news who doesn't want me there i'm shrinking up man i am like oh my god boy, get me out of here i can't even leave like i'm in the front seat and i get up and i and i'm just like well i'm like i mean i guess you guys don't want me there's not like i had something i was gonna say but there's really no point in it because and because they like it was like a sweeping they're just like you know no commercialization out in the sound they pounded their gavel uh kicked me off the island as it were and uh sent me on my way and that was that was my second year in business and my whole entire trip collapsed wow i thought that story was going to end with a good ending but it didn't obviously you got kicked off and closed down yeah yeah they they, they shut they shut me down but i i did i did come back and and meet with the um with the commissioners a couple of them uh the one who had me on the news would not see me. He would not talk to me. He wouldn't take any of my meeting. He wouldn't take a meeting or a request, wouldn't answer my email, nothing. He was just like, you know, we've made up our mind, you're shut down, whatever. The ones that would listen, I said, listen, I've been in this industry a long time. I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is prevent Crab Island 2 from happening out here. And I know that may seem counter, like counterintuitive to what you see out here, but the reality of it is you guys have 600 boat rentals in this town, 500 boat rentals. It's crazy the amount of boats and jet skis they have here. And <clears throat> What I'm doing is I'm servicing, let's say 50 people or 40 people that would take up anywhere from five to 10 boats, depending on the family size and you know, five to 10 jet skis. And I'm servicing doing like a sort of a ride share, if you will, is the best way I can describe it for water sports. And they're all out here. They're all under, they're, we're all being safe. You have a licensed captain, you have a drug tested captain, you have somebody that's not going out drinking, get behind the wheel of a boat. So we have less boats, we have more accountability, it's a safer environment. And like if, and one of the, one of the uh, council members to, to his credit, like I saw like a light bulb go off in his head. And I was like, yeah, so if everybody did water sports like this, instead of the way you got the, the way they're doing it here currently, you'd have a lot less boats, you'd have a lot less accent, you'd have a lot less BUIs, and you wouldn't have the congestion of tra Crab Island. That's one, but you guys got rid of that. Now, if you think I'm gonna go slowly into the night and give up, you're sorely mistaken. Like I'm going to rent this boat. I'm going to rent those jet skis. And I'm going to do what you guys legally allow and continue to pay my mortgage. But now I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it like everybody else is doing. So I don't want I, to be honest, Pete. I don't want 25 boats. I wish I just yeah. had one big boat and I could, you know what I mean, service all of our <laughs> guests and have a cap. It's not the way they particularly like doing business here. So. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I say that in the same breath, I wouldn't, though, because I don't want to be out there driving a boat. I don't want to deal with the captain anymore. Now I just get my money per boat. The people drive off. We do everything we can humanly possible, make sure they're not drinking, driving, that they're safe. We have guides out there. I, I go so far above and beyond. Uh, and that's not just for them. That's my number one concern is to keep my people safe. But at the same time, 
I have an accident, somebody gets killed on a jet ski because they're drinking and riding a ski or something like that. Like it's bad for the entire industry. So this is what I told them. I said, we're, you know, I'll still send my boats down to those islands because I love them. It's less congested. I think it's safer than the 500 boats and, and all the alcoholics at Crab Island, locals included. And, you know, I'll just continue to do business like that. And I'll just do it by your model. And I'll create more of a problem that you guys are, have been, are trying to fight against, ironically, and as you said at the beginning of the show, 25 boats later, well, here I am. 15 so jet skis most, too. <laughs> most of your boats now, most of jet, all that is rentals. Does the guides go with them or is it all rentals? It's it well, so it's um so my jet skis, um, I still They're do rent. tours. I just I, the all jet right. skis, I still your guided tour with dolphins, and then we do offer captain. Uh, ex- we do offer captain excursions. We have a couple captains that work for us. And, uh, you know, people seem to really enjoy that. I-, I like it. The only problem is, is being in the South, a lot of big groups. So without having those uh, those vessels as inspected vessels, and I'm not going to get into that. You can't get them inspected as, a, uh, as commercial vessels. You can only put six people on it. So when you have a group of 10 or 11 people or anything over six, it makes it, it, makes it not uh, scalable. So, Kevin, I can't remember where it was, but the first time I heard you talk, I can't remember where it was, but somewhere, is obviously we're in the tour operating business and we've met thousands of tour operators. We're in the tourpreneur community with thousands of operators and tours and experiences of what we do. But everybody has a, not everybody, but most operators, when they get to a certain uh, age, standard learning, their experiences are pretty good, and that's not my opinion because I can go into all the data and look at how many reviews experiences get globally by destination and all the rest of it, and then compare it to hotels and compare it to uh, restaurants and compare it to other stuff, which I've done. And tours and activities always scored very highly. So to me, that's always been the entrance to the game. By having a great experience allows you in the game of business in our sector. However, when I speak to a lot of operators, they think it's all about the tour. It's all about the experience. And it is. It has to be brilliant to get the customer uh, experience it and coming back. However, when I first heard you talking, you were focusing on the business side, which is, from my experience, pretty rare from operators. They're normally focused on the, the operational side and the deliverance of the tour. And you don't hear that many really... I think you're ranting about the, the business side. I do hear lots of yeah. operators ask lots of questions, hence we exist in Tupreneur, because lots and lots of questions. But you seem to have got really deep into the business side. How did how did that come about? Because it didn't come about from when you were guiding as a parasail guide. So how did you get into the business side of it? Yeah, so the, the tour side of it, the experience side of it, I mean, I had, I, I did it for 10 years. I, I, I know how to entertain people, show them a good time. So that part of it, that part of it was fine. Uh, the second piece of it was making sure my staff understood how important that was. So that's where it goes from a transactional to experiential. And it's something I'm really proud of that almost all of our all of our reviews are always about our staff and, and about our team and how great customer service was. So right in the beginning, I focused on, I read all, I started reading all the good books, all the best business guys, Steve Jobs biography. I listened to business podcasts. Uh, I really, I really wanted to drill down first in the marketing side of it to, to really make sure we had people coming through the door. I knew that that was the most important thing was that people came, came through the door. I could train my staff on a show, everybody how to have a good time and deal in on, or dial in on every detail to make sure that the customer experience and the customer service was uh, going to be the best in the, in our industry, best in, best in the, in our region at the very least. And, and then the business, the business side of it, it just, and what I still do, like right now, I'm really, in, I'm really enshrined in like learning about finance. I, I'm, I really want to understand how, large corporations operate because when you look at at the entire business sphere i'm not in, i'm not inspired by my neighbor i'm inspired by the practices i see at amazon or the culture i see at 
uh, Apple, I'm not saying those companies specifically, but when I'm looking at business in general, I'm I'm looking at like the Beatles, right? I'm looking at the Yankees. I'm seeing what they're doing. I'm seeing what the, the biggest businesses in, in the world are doing and then trying to emulate some of some of those those practices. So when I started my company, even from the beginning, I looked at the biggest water sport company in South Florida. They were doing 30 million in revenue. And, and I, I start I had built my own website. I'm probably like most of the two entrepreneurs that are listening to this. I, I did everything myself, but on that shoestring budget, how could I emulate what the, the biggest guy in the industry was doing? Every time I talked to a marketer, they did the exact same thing. Oh, who are your three biggest competitors? So it's like, to me, it was just sort of common sense to figure out the marketing side of it and learn as much, as much as I could about the marketing and sales so I could keep customers coming through the door. And then I started lear- then I started really paying attention to the business side, which I'm still learning. I'm, I'm five years in and, and I'm still learning about all this stuff, systems and processes. I got... I got baptized in fire in that after I had my son and then I, I had a heart attack because I had to have, I had to have, I had to have systems and processes that could, that could solve for me not being here as much and having COVID and a wife that worked in, um, the, my wife was an ER nurse for all of COVID. She was working anywhere from, you know, 12 to 16 hour shifts. We had a baby boy. And then I had a heart attack. The business itself, it, it just couldn't survive without me. It had to thrive. And we're still and are still to this day very much still in a growth phase. So it, it didn't have to just sustain. It had to thrive. It had to still match my ambition. The only way we could do that was good hiring practices uh, and, and learning. So I attribute most of that to my team. You mentioned marketing. Uh, it's obviously very topical. Comes up every single day on the group. Entrepreneur yeah. group. <laughs> most operators, not all, but most operators don't like marketing. They struggle with it. Uh, some of them outsource it. Some of them try to do it in house if they haven't got going and they haven't got the cash to outsource it. But most people struggle with it. So, what would you be your advice be to people on the marketing side of business if they have just been going a year, two years, three years? So sometimes I think entrepreneurs, business owners, founders, they all struggle with this sort of like, like I said in the beginning, you got to that cliff and you make that jump, right? I'm sure, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, most, most of your tour operators, they started off working for someone else, right? Yeah. So not, okay, not, so. Always in, not always in tourism, but the vast, a huge percentage of your membership were guides. For someone else before they jumped to become a right become an so <clears throat> you're not necessarily dealing with with somebody that's a, from an entrepreneurial mindset these are lifestyle operators right they want to enjoy what they're doing they're probably big fans of like simon sinek start with why they're passionate about what they're doing these guys and so now you're put yourself into a position where if you want to thrive if you want to kill if you want to be the best in class now you have to have an entrepreneurial mindset and that becomes very difficult because the dollars you get a couple dollars in you don't want to keep on putting that money back out these aren't gamblers you you know you these aren't sick degenerate entrepreneurial guys that are just willing to throw everything they got on the line every single time most of them like they love what they do they're passionate about what they do and this is probably speaks to the point of making sure their tours are really great. And so they're not really interested in sitting in an office or sitting behind a computer. And hell, neither am I, man. Like it, it, it's, it takes a lot for me to come into this late sometimes. But, you know, to, to that point, um, you have to keep gambling and you have to gamble on marketing. Like the ga- marketing is like one of those things where you have to put the dollars in. Like I see in the group all the time. Sometimes I'm like, am I in the tourpreneur group or am I in like SEOs anonymous or something like that? And that's because they feel like, oh, if I just get that number one ranking, well, that's fantastic. You're like well, ranked number one organically. Well, did you build your own website? Fantastic. It's probably pretty crappy. Is there ad copy in there? Probably not because you're not thinking about, you don't have a sales mindset. You're you're not like thinking from a customer's point of view as as to how to close them. You're just thinking about like, man, they're going to really enjoy this bit of cheese or wine or waterfall or whatever it is. 
and you're not thinking from a um, you're not thinking from a point of you have to continue to you have to continue to invest over and over and over again. And marketing is a continual investment. Right. You have to. And, and there's and there's no guarantee it's going to pay off. In fact, a lot of times in the beginning, it's not. You're going to have crappy marketers. You're going to have crappy websites. Well, guess what? That's like, remember, the first day on your tour, you know what I mean? You were probably scared. You were nervous. You didn't know the material. You didn't know really how to engage people. And then this is like muscle memory. So it's the same thing. Now, like I was we were I was just talking to my buddy the other day about you know, by getting our first loan on a boat. And I was just like, I couldn't breathe. I'm like, oh my God, like if I default on this loan, like this boat's like $60,000, like what am I going to do? And I mean, there's guys out there every day that are laying out, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on, and, and it's just a continual bet. So marketing is no different. The difference between marketing is, is that you can learn enough just to be dangerous. And then once you know enough, and you got to hand that off. You got to hand it somebody off. That's all they think about is, uh, is SEO and pay-per-click and Facebook and all that stuff. Like either you're going to be the world's best tour operator or you're going to be the world's best marketer. Like, I mean, you can dance around in both fields, but at the end of the day, if you want to scale, you have to hand some of this stuff off. And marketing is one of them where you should. You should give it to people who know what they're doing. You could supplement that. You can be on the other side of that. You can help. You can say, hey, this, you know, this is it. This is engaging content. This is great. You can have team members that are around that. But if you don't have either somebody either in-house handling all of those duties or you pay an agency, that's not, way, that's, you are the CEO. You're the owner. The way I looked at marketing over the years was I did learn it. I, I did the hours and I spent the money. I mean, I, I became pretty successful with Facebook ads when they were performing really well. And people were like, how did you do that? But I burned seventy thousand, well, in your money, ninety thousand dollars to be able right, to right. do Facebook ads, and so yeah, the hour of the time you have to put in. But even though I put the hours and time in, there was lots of stuff that I knew I was just never going to be good at marketing with. I just wasn't yeah. going to, and I didn't want to put the time in to learn that stuff. So I would always employ professionals at an agency, and it was a lot to do with frameworks and the back ends of website, not necessarily the content, because I could do the content myself and we could do the social ourselves within our team where we're communicating with the customers. But a lot of the frameworks, a lot of making sure that the infrastructure of the marketing was built by professionals. And then we went to work on it because we knew the foundations were built by guys and girls who were, were pros. And, and we weren't pros, we were amateurs at it, but we were willing to put a lot of, a lot of effort, a lot of time and a lot of hours in because we knew it was essential especially when social came on, because if you're going to be social, you know, it's only an opinion, everybody have different opinions, but the best people to be social are the people who work and live in the company, not an agency, because an agency well, can never communicate the way that the people who live and work in the company can. A hundred percent. I mean, like you speak in my language, man. That's exactly, you know, right? Like, so for example, right now, I have somebody in our office that she handles a lot of our administration stuff. She answers our phone. She does check-in. And we're dead right now. It's October. We're going to be really, it's cold. We're not doing a ton of water sports. But she's in there. Like right now, she's going to take a call with HubSpot. She's going to figure out what other, because we're going really heavy into social and TikTok this year. So I need a content distribution platform. So we do have in-house. I'm going to pay her all. And she's not a marketer. She's She's going to be a lawyer, actually. <laughs> she's, just, she's getting ready to go to law school, oddly enough. But she's smart. You know, she can handle it. We had an open office, so she took that office. And now <clears throat> I'll put, I, I, if I have an idea and I delegate it to her, I tell her like what my vision is for this idea. I give her like at least a, a starting point. And then we have, the, we have uh, uh, an agency that works for us. And I put them together. I put them together. And, and even that agency, hey, we're looking for a great content distribution platform. Who do you guys use? Because even as an agency, you know, they're making a couple posts for us every week on Instagram and Facebook, but they're not, they're not drilling it down because I don't pay them that much because I'd I have to pay them an ungodly sum of money to get the reach that I, I want to attain. So I'm paying them and I'm paying somebody who's not a marketing professional to do some of the 
the ground the groundwork to implement our marketing strategies. So again, I couldn't do this. I, I couldn't sit here and deal with HubSpot and take videos and take pictures and 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 do updates to our website. There's this it's it's too much. But the the point is is that it wasn't like I didn't and I have these conversations all the time with some of my friends in the industry. They're like, man, how do I, you know, how do I get to do what you do? Well, you okay, you you have no problem gambling on equipment, gambling on this, gambling on this new idea, starting this new business. But at the same point in time, you get real timid and you start clutching your pearls when it comes to and your wallet when it comes to your marketing. You you don't that you don't want to you don't want to spend a ton of money on. The thing is, it's just like the bull, right? The fish bowl theory. So you have a you have a fish. And the bull is this big, that fish is never going to outgrow that bull. Like you can't expect the customers to come in and then put, it doesn't work like that. And then put the money in. Oh, when I get the money, no, you got to put, you got to lay the money out. You got to lay, this is our first year paying people to sit in an office and answer phones and do content work when money is just, we're just bloodletting money (laughs) into the street right now, but it's going to pay back next season when we go from 25 to 30 boats those boats will be filled with the people from the work that we're doing now like anything else in business you have to put in the work then you get the reward and it's like that in every single instance of everything that you do one of the things i slightly struggle with tour operators on this and i get that why people don't like marketing and sales i totally get it especially when you're coming into this industry to do what you're passionate about and what you love about but if you've jumped off that cliff and you've started a business with all that goes with it and the number of years of chaos you're going to have because that's just reality it's also an opportunity to you do not know where your life is going you didn't know you were going to have a heart attack you have no idea where your life's going you wake up one day and everything's changed but when you're generating cash flow from a tour business doing what you love it's actually paying you to get educated if you get yourself educated in marketing and sales it doesn't really matter what happens in your business life going forward because you will always be able to turn a dollar if you know a bit about marketing and about, about sales. You may not be a tourpreneur for the rest of your days. You may get sick of the industry, you may leave, or health concerns happen that forces you to leave, or you get old and grumpy like me and you decide you can't start, you have to stop running up down mountains. But if you understand enough marketing and the ability to sell, you're never going to be hungry. Yeah, yeah, you're always going to be able to, you're always going to be able to kill and then eat what you kill. And I had a, I have a friend that's been an entrepreneur for a really long time, and even even now, like I, I still struggle with the uh, imposter syndrome. You know, like um, you know, because I did have a job, and this did start off as a lifestyle thing for me, and and I faced, uh, man, just about every, uh, we, like we, I lost my spot on the island when I was a tour guide. I lost my location uh, last year with uh, fifteen boats. You want to talk about difficult? Uh, try trying to figure out like one of the most congested areas and a place to put 15 boats where no one can even get their foot in the door. And luckily a really good friend of mine and uh, my business partner, I also have a Jeep rental company on the Jeep side, uh, had a second location that just was faltering because his partner and him, neither one of them were necessarily could be down there doing the day to day. They both had other businesses, lives, families, and it was just a company that wasn't really getting a ton of love. And, and I luckily, um, they sold it to me and we were able to put our boats there and, and grow. But, you know, I deal with the same thing everybody else deals with. Like, man, like it's like this catastrophizing, like, catastrophizing, like, you know, oh, man, I like, lose my place. I have a heart attack or I lo- lo- get kicked off the island or any one of these things. And I'm like always, OK, well, what if this happens? Well, what if this happens? I don't have answers to that. I can't even solve for what I don't know. Right. But at this at the same time, like, I, man, I'll just be like on the street and I don't I'd have to go take a job. But to your point, it's like, well, you learn how to market, you learn how to sell, you learn how to problem solve. Right. You get punched in the gut enough times you lay in there and bad looking up at the ceiling, wondering how you're going to make payroll. Maybe you're, you're, you're struggling with marketing, getting people on your tour, or maybe you're doing great and you get busted, you get kicked out of your location, or one of the 1,000 things that can happen. You get regulated. There's this every day. There's some, to your point, like you, you're learning not just the, the skill sets of sales and marketing and business, 
you're you're building you're you're sort of like building this callus around you that where you're just like well i have no choice but to get up and keep on moving forward like there's no I, Pete, when i was in when i was in icu i ordered a, a rogue rack because my biggest concern a rogue is like uh like bench press my biggest concern was that i could still work out that i could still do the things that provide stress release for me so i'm laying in there having a heart attack thinking and how can I lift heavy when I get out of here? And it's no, it's no different. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, you're going to get hit. Like maybe it's like a massive tax bill or something like that. Or you're going to change the regulations around your industry, or they're going to come up with some city code that doesn't allow you to walk, you know, between these times of the day or drive your vehicle down this certain road. And it's not that you don't have the answers. It's that you, you built up the mental bandwidth to come up with those answers, if not on the fly, but, or even in the interim, but long-term. And you're going to figure out a solution one way or another, because now you're wired to come up with solutions. Sure. One of the things I've, I've noticed with Tupreneur, and particularly with operators who are, say, sub five years in the business, because the world has digitalized and because travel is digitalized, it's actually quite easy to enter this business now. Maybe not as easy if you're buying boats and assets because you've got quite a bit of cash to lay out. But if you want to run a tour operation, you can actually enter this business really, really cheaply right? because you can just, whatever you're passionate about, whatever your knowledge is, you can set up some tours, you can whack them on some marketplaces, you can start generating revenue via marketplaces, cash coming in, and then you can slowly pick up and learn marketing if, if that's your desire. But what I've noticed with a lot of the operators have not been around a long time, they're treating the industry as a purely inbound industry. So it's marketing driven, and it is. We are a marketing driven industry, and again, we are dealing with inbound. But they sort of miss the business development side. Everyone's in different destinations. Uh, there is opportunity around wherever you're operating, whatever city you're in, whatever area you're in. There's more opportunity around you in that area to drive business than any marketplace is going to give you because the people are in destination ready yeah. to book experiences but i'm not seeing the operators crunching the doing the road miles doing the door knocking visiting every hotel in the destination working with every transport company visiting every restaurant and that endless hours of networking with other business owners in tourism that don't do what you yeah. do to, and you're going to get knocked back so many times but you've got to keep doing it because over time you build up relationships and then you build up all these small channels of business that's coming in that yep. don't just come in for a season, but then come in for a season after season after season after season. And I don't care how much time or effort you've put in, if you've scored a, a deal with another tourism operator and you're still getting business for them 10 years down the line, whatever effort you put in has been worth it. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a, that's like a big lesson, like, like marketing and, and SEO and pay-per-click and social, it's all fun, sexy, great stuff. But if you, if you don't, if you can't like it co-mingle with, with, with your community, if you can't get out and absolutely door knock, concierges, hotels, other business operators, you want to make a friend with somebody that had a business before the internet or talk to your mentor that you work for before go sit down and talk with somebody who built a, 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 a or scaled a business before the internet like like a guy like you you remember how hard it was to acquire or all the work that it took to acquire customers pre-internet listen because buyer behavior has changed that's fine but still human interaction still matters like greatly. So if you're doing it on your tours and, and you're, you're creating these interactions, you need to get out there in, in your community. And because there is a, there's not just the internet and a computer as it is an acquisition channel. There is, there's like about a thousand other acquisition channels that came before the internet that still exist that you should be optimizing, coming up with some type of systems and process, even if you can't do it yourself, that you're designating someone else to be getting out there and doing it. The email, phone calls, relationships, community, all of this stuff still matters. And it matters more than just acquiring through a transactional process online. In fact, I would argue to say that it matters more. 
if, if you do the numbers, you look at the industry numbers that the rival guys stick out. Offline is still a bigger channel than online. And absolutely. And although we throw about the word offline, often like off, often it's still online. It's just a complicated online. But you open up these channels with partners. Well, but certainly from my experience, our multiple channels with local partners drove way more business than any marketplace or combination of marketplaces. So the biggest names in the world with the billions of pound dollars investment, your viators, your get your guys, all of these things, they provided a tiny amount of business compared with local partners' business because the people were in destination looking for things to do. And people yeah, still communicate. People still speak to people in hotels. People still go into lodges and read old-fashioned leaflets that happen to be lying on the table in the in the in the place. And if you've yeah, optimized, sure. if you've optimized your digital for local, when they're sitting looking at their iPhone in their hotel room or their lodge, you're going to you're going to come up. Or if you're dropping Facebook ads on that hotel network or that lodge network, and you're dropping ads right on top of it. You're right in front of them, and and, and if you've tapped up the conscientious, the restaurant owners, and how many how many people from the accommodation has the operator gone and said, look, your staff have been working really hard this year. Can we take your staff out for a free afternoon, and do that? And you're amazing how many reviews come from them staff to other customers to send them your ways. It's the old fashioned ways are not old fashioned. They're still completely valid valid in building a business today. Absolutely. You, you have to be look. You have to look in the corners. Uh, you, ha you have to like you know, sweep up your floor. You, you can't just do like the main area where everybody's hanging out. You got to move stuff. You got to sweep in them corners. You got to get every single cob up. I don't like we're I, I'll put we're in the midst of putting a, a get your guide listing right now. I don't care if there's five people that see that even if they don't book to get because nobody uses get your guide in this. Like I was one of the first people to really optimize our OTA, the OTA channels here because it wasn't even necessarily them booking through OTAs. It was just them seeing us, like, as you said. So they, they spoke to someone, they, hey, where's the place to go to? Everybody like assumes they understand the buyer's journey, that they Google like things to do near me. And then they see the SEO organic listing, they click on that listing, they like the price, they take the booking. Like who books like that? Nobody books anything like that. You certainly don't, you know, you talk to people, you do your due diligence, you look around. And even if it's a, 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 a even if it's a 24 to 48 hour window, it's just like something like immediate, right? You have no idea where they're coming from. You, they talk to their, as you said, they talk to their concierge, they talk to their waiter, they talk to whomever, and then they Google it and then you pop up. You have to be in every single corner that you can think of. And that's just not online. Like the online stuff, a lot of times that's not even the first place. That's just maybe the third or the fourth place that you end up popping up. And then they do a little bit more due diligence and they see your GMB and then they see your reviews. But if that initial, that initial referral comes from somebody they spoke to, that carries just as much weight, if not more, than your yeah, organic yeah. listing on Google. Yeah. Uh, from experience, I found the multi-day operators, people who are doing multi-day, are a bit more, not so much with the locals around it because it can be irrelevant for them, but they are good at doing business to business, opening up channels with mm. other tour operators, opening up channels with DMCs, opening up channels with various verticals because they know business to business on, on that. It's the day operators that tend to be relying just on the digital world Obviously, we all know the speed digital is growing and it is going to end up the majority at some point. But when you look at how the amount of years we've had digital, it's still going to be a significant time before it is the majority of, of our business. Therefore, to ignore the majority of business seems a bit naive, but we do have a lot of a lot of operators doing it. That multi day, the multi day, because I've never done a multi day tour. Um, I'm typically one of those guys that. When I go somewhere, I, I typically book everything myself. I love researching and learning about the place that I'm going. But those multi-day tours, uh, they can get pretty pretty pricey, right? Like, I mean, yeah. thousands of dollars, upwards of thousands of dollars. You know, I used to sell multi-day um, anything 750 to 15,000. Wow, yeah. So I don't know anybody, definitely not myself. If I'm dropping, <laughs> I'm dropping 50 Gs on a tour, man. 
I'm probably not going to book that online. I'm probably going to want to talk to you. <laughs> I'm probably going to do so much due diligence. And then I'm going to need to speak to the operator because that, that is such a, a massive, it's like, it could be like a once in a lifetime experience and focusing just on digital. Like, I mean, I don't, uh, maybe other than an Airbnb, which is obviously like a commodity, but if you're trusting somebody with the entirety, entirety, entirety of your vacation, I imagine that that a phone call is going to come through like a minimum. Any, one any multi-day call. operator who is not communicating with the guest in a personal way, be it that chat box, be it email, be it phone, be it video call, which not enough operators are doing video calls and they try, they convert like nothing else on earth. Highest conversion you'll get is if you do one-to-one -one video calls with clients. Now, obviously, if your clients are paying you $50 and you've got thousands of clients, it's not feasible. But if your clients are paying you three and a half thousand dollars upwards and two and a half thousand dollars upwards, I don't care who you are, you've got time to spend 20 minutes on a video call with that client because that will get the trust, that will get the feeling that they want to be with you because you can get your passion across, your inspiration across, and your conversion rate will go through the roof on video calls. So, yeah, multi day I, is. I we will spend 20 minutes on a customer for a $120, $150 jet ski. I don't care yeah. anybody's math. The ROI on paying somebody 15 bucks an hour and them staying 15 minutes to be on the phone like that. That's a big one that I get like really frustrated with operators when I'm talking about like they just want to get off the phone so bad. It's like, look, man, like first of all, you're paying for this lead to come through. You're not converting it because you want to get off the phone so bad. And then you're losing them over to your other customer. Like $100 for 15 minutes, man, times four is $400 an hour. And that's on the, you know, again, like that could be a, it, and that's like the minimal side of it. I don't know. You spend, like you're sitting there answering the phone anyway. Like we're going to get their call. They want to go do something, like spend the time with them, have the conversation for, for, for 50 grand. I, for 50 grand, I, I talked to my wife for an hour. You know, <laughs> I don't want to talk to her for five minutes, man. <laughs> for 50 Gs, I would talk to you for like a week straight. I wouldn't stop calling, man. I would be like a, a car salesman from hell for yeah. a 10 or $20,000 tour. So, man, like you guys are, if you guys are like really not being on, like expect people to convert online, like, maybe in a couple of years, but man, I'm like, I'm not buying a house online. I'm not buying a car online. I'm definitely not spending over, you know, what, that amount of money the, without having interaction. Because we're all technology focused now and we have to be, and we we take advice and there's nothing wrong with that. The technology companies that support this industry are great and we're really lucky to have them. And there's some fantastic mm -hmm. technology supporting this industry that in my opinion is really cheap because I'm that old that I can remember paying stupid amounts of money for technology where it's now really cheap. But one of the failures with the technology company, companies that are supporting us, is there, and it's in their interest, this is why they do it, and maybe because some of them have not been operators, they don't do it, they focus everything to a book now button. They try to get everything off the media, everything off the websites, apart from that book now button. Now, for certain operators, that is fine, but it's only fine for a minority of operators, and I would argue the operators it's fine for are high volume, High, high volume operators that cannot turn that booking that they're getting into more money. So if you're high volume, like if you're a hop on, hop off bus going around Orlando or going around can all the cities of the world, absolutely perfect. Can you can give them one option on there as well as the ticket, and it will work for that. But if you're selling any other experience where there's a guide looking after six people or eight people or twelve people, and you're just taking online bookings with a book now button you're leaving more than double of your revenue on the table. That's crazy. That just, to, to, me, to me, that's absolutely insanity. I, I, I can't imagine that, that anybody would do that. And I'll tell you what, like, this is You'd where be surprised you really, how many do that. <laughs> There's a crazy. lot of people doing it. And this is where you can, and, and I'm really passionate about this part of things, is that like starting the experience with the with the first interaction with your company, from your marketing to your phone calls, to your emails, to your chat, whatever it may be, that the beginning of that experience, that the moment they interact with your company, it becomes a five-star experience. And now if you can get somebody on the phone and have a conversation with them and, and continue to provide value, not even if it's with my company, look, I don't care what who you end up with. These are the things you want to look, look that you want to look out for. You truly are, are not just trying 
trying to pitch, but you're truly trying to provide value, the reality of it is you're more than likely going to not going to convert that customer. You're going to close that customer. They're going to go with you because you actually care in a digital world where everybody has outsourced their, their, their phone, their phone calls to uh, uh, reservation centers and where people are just dying to get off the phone. It's really refreshing when somebody is providing value to you on the phone. They're not just trying to close you. They want, you know, you want their business, obviously, but they want to come with you by the time, by the time it's all said and done. You can I mean, you can fight that battle against TripAdvisor, against Viator, against Get Your Guide. You can really win there. You can kick their ass. You might not be able to beat them in, in SEO and in, in the organic and pay-per-click, but you can kill them in customer service, not just on the trip, but from the moment they interact with you. And it's, it's also, when I look at the booking window of many operators, and I'm lucky to get to see a lot of the booking windows, although there's a, there is a trend and it's moving to last minute and obviously COVID put a lot to last. There's still lots and lots of operators with a booking window of 15 days, 30 days, 25 days, eight days, way before the customer's actually turning up to get the experience. If someone's booking that far in advance, I want to speak to them because I know, I know they haven't sorted out their whole trip. And if they haven't sorted out their whole trip, I'm going to find out so much information on that call that I can sell them other stuff, be that accommodation, be it transport, be it restrooms be all the partners that because of my networking previously that I've worked with and I've got deals with that I'm getting commissions from. So if you've got a booking window that allows you to speak to customers, be it, and I'm, I'm a big fan of speaking how they want. If they're chatting to me on WhatsApp or if they're on Facebook Messenger or if they're on phone, I will speak to them how they want rather than me dictating how I'll speak to them. But if you organize your business that you have lots of upsells and cross sales that you do not own, and you're working with partners, you can significantly ramp up your profitability without ramping up the number of bookings. And, and listen, uh, man, a thousand percent. We saw so much bottom line growth in our business this year from our upsells. And it, it was our sales process as well. I had an operator in my office the other day. A friend of mine came in and we talked about sales and he brought in his, the the his team that answers the phone and, and does this sort of thing. And and they and, and they kept on going like, well, you're not really like answering their questions. I'm well, yeah, because I'm still fact finding. I'm still finding out. Somebody calls me and says, how much? I want to say, well, when? When are you coming? We have different prices for different things, different days. Who's coming with you? Uh, what time of year are you going to be here? What do you, like the only way you can find, and this isn't like, you're not just, again, you're providing value. You're giving them information, but you need to find out as much information, how you can solve their problem. If they're calling you up, they have a problem, whether you know that or not. This is what we do. They have a problem is they have a big vacation. It's really daunting. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to stay. They don't know how to get from A to B. And they're calling you if you're a multi-day tour provider. And this is a huge thing. There's a ton of questions. And so you need to keep on asking more questions. The more you can find out about them, the more you can learn about what their problems and needs are. If you are dialed in with your business, then you have solutions for all of them. As Pete said, whether it's maybe it's at strategic partnerships, maybe it's something that you personally offer. There's a whole avalanche of, of, of problems problems that they have that they don't even realize yet, especially on a on a big multi-day tour with a lot of people coming. There is so much going on. Do you have kids? How old are your parents? There's like you can just ask them questions for days and then they get they think about it. They think about the tour. They think about the vacation. And now if you've done your job correctly and you've run your company correctly, you have solutions that are monetizable for them, for you. It's a win-win situation. Two weird questions that we used to get when I was operating a, a water sports business that we converted every single one, every single one, was we have dogs with us or a dog. What can you do? We had a solution for dogs. And 100%. we we are in a motorhome, a camper van. Like, what can you do for a camper van? We had a solution for camper vans. We converted right. every single one of them inquiries because every single other person they asked they didn't have a solution for camper vans or dogs. And and they, they might not even have that. You might be in the middle of discovery having a conversation with somebody and that it's like it dawns on them like, oh, do you have a solution for a camper van? Or, hey, we have it. And again, if you're calling and you're just, hey, how much? We're trying to get off the phone with you and not do a little bit of due diligence on you. That question might not come up until you start having a conversation about what the day or week or coming days are going to look like. And then it dawns on them while you're doing some fact finding that, Oh, we have our dog with us. It might, they might not even have called 
to find that out. They find out this information that you have a solution for them. Boom, you convert them right on the spot because no one's even having the conversation. Like dogs, it's crazy. All the time I get that. Oh, do you guys allow dogs on the boats? Absolutely. And here's the, here's the, here's the real nickels worth of advice I want you to take away from this. Those of you guys who just love that online stuff and love creating content. Now you have new content. Now you have a new content vehicle. Oh, we ha- we enjoy dogs. You put some wonderful, uh, you, a wonderful graphic, a dog on the on the boat or, or the camper and the place where the camper can go, wherever it may be, because this is a question and this is exactly how people search for stuff. So if you don't know that, if you're just putting in, hey, our, our boats or our experience is X amount of money and you get this out of it, you're missing out on a ton of opportunity to create a more robust marketing solution because you're having conversations with them. Like value exchanges are happening on these phones all the time. And even if you're not converting, you're at least getting enough information um, to possibly convert the next sale. The other thing I want to get across to the listeners on this and why this is, it's always been important, this, but it's now super important is so many operators can't get enough guides, can't get enough staff. Therefore, and that's probably not going to go away in the short term. So if you can't get enough staff to grow your business by number of bookings, well, then if you're going to do the same amount of bookings, you have to earn more money per booking, more money per customer. And all this stuff we've just been talking about here can dramatically increase your product, uh, your productivity and your profit without actually growing your customer numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been it's been a, a game changer for us in the last two years. The upsells, uh, getting a little bit in, into some retail stuff, because again, even if we can grow, if we if I can grow a hundred dollar product by one dollar, that's one percent bottom line revenue, minus cost of 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 the good or and some some of the stuff that we do that we do we trip protection damage protection, other than the cost of actually having to file the claim, it's it's just, it's it's astronomical how much bottom line growth that you create. But then to take and re-back it, reinvest back in your business, it's a, it's, a, it's the wonderful like machine, you know, you, you get all this great this bottom line growth. It's like, well, am I going to go buy a pool or, or am I going to go buy this thing? Or I'm going to take it and then chuck it back into marketing, give my marketing agency more money and grow and grow and grow. And like, that's the real fun, in my opinion, all business. Like I'm not for super fancy things, but I am for growth and community and building teams and teaching people and, and growing our organization. Because what the hell else would I do, man? Have, have yeah, a heart yeah. attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What else am I doing? Have a heart attack. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that one with you because I'm not really wanting to go there. I don't, I don't fancy that experience. <laughs> first. So, Kevin, I would just like to thank you very much for taking the time to be on this podcast. For our listeners, if you've got any questions for Kevin, please reach out to him. He's very open. He'll spend time with any operator. I've seen him doing it, and he'll go through things in detail. He's not shy. He will help, and it's coming from a genuine place. So, Kevin, thanks very much for this, and. Uh, I'll see you soon, hopefully. Man, thank you for having me, Pete. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Cheers, man.